In the previous chapter, we have seen the construction of the smallest uncountable ordinal number omega 1 by taking the ordinal union of all countable ordinal numbers. Its cardinality is denoted aleph 1. And we can continue. We take the union of all the ordinal numbers of the cardinality aleph 1 and get an even larger ordinal omega 2. Its cardinality is aleph 2, the second smallest uncountable. After omega 1 of size aleph 1 and omega 2 of size aleph 2, we can continue and obtain omega 3 of size aleph 3, omega 4 of size aleph 4, and so on. The ordinal union of these ordinals is denoted unsurprisingly omega omega of size aleph omega. And we can continue on ordinals using transfinite recursion. This way we reach not only omega omega plus 1 or omega omega times omega, but also for example omega omega 1. In this limit step we take the ordinal union of uncountably many previous values. And we continue. Even much further away there will be omega 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 1, omega 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 1 and so on. The world of ordinal numbers is limitless. And all of these are valid mathematical constructions. However, you could have noticed that I hesitated to just take all the ordinal numbers and their ordinal union. Soon we would end up in a contradiction. If we add one next bar to this super large union, we obtain a new ordinal number which is necessarily longer than all the possible ordinal numbers. That doesn't make sense. This problem is named after Italian mathematician Cesare Burelli Forti and it was the first sign that there is something wrong with the naive set theory. The set of all the ordinal numbers is causing trouble. However, we needed 5 videos of this series just to explain this problem. Couldn't we find a simple paradox? Why have we introduced the ordinal numbers? We have tried to construct a set of large cardinality. We started with a set of all the natural numbers, then we took its power set denoted by a calligraphic P. We repeated this process and in the limit step we took the union of all the sets constructed so far. So what about taking all the possible sets? When we take the union of them, we obtain the largest set possible. Let's denote the union as A. However, whenever we make a power set PA, we must obtain a set of a strictly larger cardinality. That's absurd. The power set should be just one of the sets that we've included in the union. And we can obtain a similar paradox even without taking a union. The power set PA can contain only sets. So instead of taking the union of all the sets, it's sufficient to pack them into a single set and declare the set of all the sets as A. This set A is a bit different than before, but the problem is still the same. The power set should be of a strictly larger cardinality, yet it contains only some of the elements of the set of all the sets. So how have we actually proven that the power set must be larger than the original set? There could be something wrong with the proof. We assumed that there is a matching between A and PA. And we found a contradiction. We fixed an element X of set A. There were two options. Either X is an element of the set matched with X. Then we color it green. Or it is not an element of the set matched with X. Then we color it red. Finally, we took the set of all the red elements. Such a set cannot be matched neither with a green element, it would be missing in the set, nor with a red element. Otherwise, it couldn't be in it. This way, we have constructed a subset that cannot be matched with any element. In our case, when A is the set of all the sets, the power set should be just part of it. It means that we are not asking if a subset matched with an element contains that element, but just if the element viewed as a set contains itself. The contradiction arises from the set of all the sets that do not contain themselves. This way we have derived probably the simplest paradox named after a British mathematician Bertrand Russell. In short, it goes as follows. We consider the set of all the sets which don't contain themselves as an element. Let's denote it as X. 
we ask whether this set contains itself. We obtain a contradiction. If x doesn't contain itself, we have to put it into x. After all, it is not containing itself. But if we put it into x, it suddenly contains itself. And vice versa. If x contains itself, it shouldn't have been included in x. So x contains itself if and only if it doesn't contain itself. Paradoxes. In particular, we can see that we didn't need the theory of cardinalities or even well-orderings to get a paradox. The theory helped to spot the issue, but the problem seems to be essential to sets. So now what to do about it? And what exactly is causing it? All the paradoxes start with taking all the sets of a certain property. Well, in the case of ordinal numbers, it is a bit hidden in the fact that an ordinal number is a type of a well-ordered set. So the set of all the ordinal numbers is the set of all the types of well-ordered sets. Then we apply a mass operation to them, we take their union or we pack them into a set. This produces a new such set. For example, a new set not containing itself. And that is the contradiction with the assumption that we have taken all such sets in the beginning. The issue is that we imagine that we can take all the sets at once and at the same time we are constructing new sets. There are no problems if we work only with sets of some fixed world. For example, with the set of points in a plane. If we construct a set of points in the plane, this set lives outside this world. It cannot produce a new point in the plane and lead to a paradox. However, the world of points in the plane is not rich enough for various mathematical constructions which we would like to perform. So we introduce another world. The world of formal set theory. With this, there is a shift in terminology. In the case of points in the plane, it makes sense to call points objects and collections of points with certain property sets. However, the objects of formal set theory will be for good reasons called sets. That means that we need another name for collections of sets with some property. We call them classes. A natural idea would be to continue and give another name to collections of classes, but that is not the approach of the mainstream set theory. Using classes is rather for exceptional cases. The main effort is to keep as much as possible inside the world of sets. The sets of this world aren't just ordinary sets after all. It is important to keep in mind that the set only means an object for us now. So on the lowest level a set is nothing but a word. We can draw them let's say as dots. Once we call them sets they should also contain some elements. But in the world of formal sets, the only objects here are sets. So some sets here can be elements of other sets. Again, an element of a set is just a word from the formal perspective. The idea that a set A plays the role of an element of a set B can be denoted with an arrow, a directed edge from set A to set B. In general, the dots, vertices, denote sets here and the arrows, or oriented edges, denote set membership. So the entire world of formal sets isn't in some sense anything more than a huge directed graph. However, because we are looking at it with the optics of sets, also other set theoretic words have meaning here. For example, a subset. The fact that the set A is a subset of a set B means that all the elements of set A are also members of set B, and set B can also contain something extra. By the way, set inclusion is independent of the fact if there is an arrow between A and B or not. All this means that any set can be also understood as a class. And it is usually better to imagine sets as sets rather than as vertices of some graph. We just have to keep in mind that on the other hand, not every class has to be a set. For example, there are no sets corresponding to the class of all the ordinal numbers or the class of all the sets. That would lead to paradoxes we discussed earlier. 
Such classes, which do not correspond to any set, are called proper classes. However, as mentioned earlier, proper classes are rather exceptions. We will try to keep as much math as possible inside the formal world of sets. In the following chapters, we are primarily going to discuss the question what a set can be. This question has intentionally two meanings. In the next, ninth chapter, we will look at axioms of set theory. These are the rules on which mathematicians agreed that the formal world of sets should satisfy. Most of the axioms are providing basic tools for constructing new sets from other sets. So we will answer the question of what sets we can afford in formal set theory. And the other meaning of the question? You could have noticed that I mentioned that ordinal numbers are a part of the class of all the formal sets. And not only ordinal numbers, also cardinal numbers, matchings, real numbers, orderings, Virtually any mathematical object can be encoded as a specific formal set. We will see this in practice in various following chapters. This feature makes the formal set theory a powerful tool that is used by almost any mathematical discipline if it wants to demonstrate its solid foundations. In the next chapter, we are finally going to look at the axioms of set theory. In particular, there are the axioms of existence, extensionality, pairing, Union, separation, infinity, power set, replacement, choice, and regularity. See you then!